Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and for all mothers, happy Mother's Day. My name is Maureen and I'm an executive at Mind Science Center and I'll be your host for today. The event will be starting very soon, but before that, there are a few housekeeping rules. First of all, please keep your mask on at all times and while safe distancing measures have been relaxed, I would still, we would still highly recommend that you stay within your seats and minimize movement throughout the event. Secondly, please also set your phones to a silent mode before we start the event. Uh, should you need any assistance, please feel free to approach any of my colleagues. They are on the site and they should be waving their hands about now. <laughs> yes, and lastly, we request for your understanding as to remain seated as we wait for the arrival of our guest of honor, Senior Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security, Mr. Tio Chi Hien. And while we wait, please enjoy this video. The inspiration to start the Age Well Every Day program was after our research on dementia prevention at Jurong. The Age Well Every Day program is an innovative program for senior citizens in Singapore for dementia prevention and also it's helpful for people with depression. We have now eight centres in Singapore and now we're extending to more centres in Singapore and also for the region around Asia. The AW program has made a difference in that it has helped people to be aware as well as to practice the four components that we have taught them. I thought it's very interesting that we are able to do something to help old people in that way. If we are able to delay the onset of physical disability or dementia, we then make the person continue to an independence of life. AW is conceptualized as a four component program the first component is health education program. The second component is MAP or Mindful Awareness Practice. The third component is MRT, stands for Music Reminiscence Therapy. And the fourth component is the group exercise program. Well, the most memorable time was when I witnessed an elderly Malay lady, almost 90 years old, who came for the program. And on the last day of the program, there was a award of certification of the attendance and she brought along her grandchildren and children who have been to the university and it was a delight to see the family together and they are all there to support her in uh, running through this program. The most memorable um, experiences to my mind is the graduation ceremonies because uh, we see what we have trained and we see the playback of what we have taught uh, these older adults. Uh. And it's very nice to see that they are able to do things well and also add refinements and improvements to what we taught them. So far, we have trained 300 adults. Many of them actually continue to be trainers. So the ball is kept rolling. How I chance upon this program because I accompanied my mom to Kwang San and I was attracted by a poster, Dementia Prevention Program. So I signed up this uh, uh, program uh, as I want to know more about dementia. Every time my mom uh, attended the class, she will be very happy and every time she's uh, very eager to attend the next class. I want to share the happiness and knowledge to the senior, so I signed up the program to be an instructor. After attending the HR every day, I know about the healthy eating plate. I follow the instruction of the uh, healthy eating plate as well as exercise. So I managed to lose 10 kilo within six months and my cholesterol, my blood pressure has gone back to normal. The senior at this uh, Guang Ming San, they find the program very interesting, especially they like the horticulture, uh, health education part. So at the end of the program, they refuse to be graduated. So they say, I want to be Liu Pan. <laughs> I started my journey with the Paita team at Jalan uh, Tenaga, tri Block 666 where they, they were teaching the Paita exercises that, that is uh, known as the Meridian Flapping. It's a self-healing technique. By chance, I met a friend. She encouraged me to join the team. So as I progressed well, one of my senior instructors introduced me to the UNOS CCAWD as a volunteer. Three and a half years experience went by without feeling bored. I was motivated 
and I learned a lot by leading a healthier, happier lifestyle. I thank the Mind Science Centre for arranging a choral singing via Zoom, which was really interesting. Everybody singing in harmony. And again, thank you for again arranging a lovely choir teacher. She made us so comfortable and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I'm inspired to be a volunteer because uh, my mom was diagnosed with dementia. As a caregiver, I understand the challenge of the caregiving journey. I always wonder if there's a way that we can delay the onset of dementia. So when I go about this program, I was very hopeful because I feel that the program is meaningful and it's aimed to delay the onset of dementia. Uh, to facilitate the mindfulness sessions, I learned more about mindfulness, particularly to be more mindful of my action, thoughts and speech in my daily life. Besides that, because I'm helping on the health education as well, by researching for the program itself, it gave me a lot of tips to better take care of myself. Uh, during the COVID situations, uh, where we cannot have the face-to-face -face interactions, we have to find a way to go online. And ultimately, we managed to do that. And it's very heartwarming to see that the participants and the volunteers are able to join together to meet up again online to continue the program. Overall, the volunteer journey has been a memorable one and it's also an important achievement to me in my life. Gentlemen, let us welcome our guest of honor, Senior Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security, Mr. Teo Chi Hien. Welcome everyone. Once again, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the fifth Do Tiang Seng Distinguished Lecture Series, Aging with Dignity. Kindly note that this event will be recorded for archival and marketing purposes, and you as and our partners may be using some of the image and the videos in our online and print publications. Also, for those joining us online, if you need any assistance, please use the chat function and my colleague will be assisting you. Today's event is organized by the Mind Science Center with support from Mr. Tao Hengdan, and donors who have supported Mind Science Center mission to improve mental health and resilience across all ages. Fully dependent on grants and donations, Mind Science Center is deeply grateful for all your continued support. We would also like to thank NUHS Corporate uh, Communications Office for all their help in media publicity for this event. We strive to continue improving health outcomes through translational research, which impact will be felt now and beyond our lifetimes. Today's program will include the launch of our latest book, Aging with Dignity, written by researchers and volunteers of the AWE program, edited by Professor Kwa Yi Hyok and Associate Professor Rati Mahendran, and published by Wright Editions. The book will be officiated by Senior Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security, Mr. Tio Chi Hian, shortly. In the subsequent segment, Prof Kwa will be delivering a keynote lecture. This will be followed by a panel discussion with AWE trainer and volunteer, Associate Professor Shivali Shori, Mr. Abdul Rashid Ibrahim, and Mrs. Wee Gyokha. The panel discussion will be chaired by Associate Professor Rati Mahendra. Without further ado, let us welcome the, the Director of Mind Science Center, Associate Professor John Wong, to give his welcome address. Prof Wong, please.
Senior Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security, Mr. Teo Chi Hien, Dr. Chong Chun Kong, our Chairman of uh, My Science Centre, Mr. Abdullah Tamuhi, our former Speaker of Parliament, Professor Kwa Hee Hock, the Distinguished uh, Lecturer for the 5th uh, To Tiang Sing Lecture, and uh, of course the Book Editor for Aging with Dignity. Professor Rati Mahindran, um, Co-Editor of the Aging with Dignity, uh, My Science Centre Board members, distinguished guests, partners, colleagues, and audience over the Zoom webinar. Very good afternoon. Today is Mother's Day. Uh, take this opportunity to wish all the loving and lovely mothers a very happy and blessed Mother's Day. On behalf of the My Science Centre, uh, I would like to warmly welcome everybody here to the fifth Do Tian Seng Lecture series and today is entitled Aging with Dignity. We are gathered here today to celebrate an amazing milestone for the Age Well Everyday program where we have translated key evidence-based research findings from past data into community-based programs. This is to help us enhance senior mental well-being and prevent deterioration of cognitive function. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all collaborators in this program, research scientists, community partners, donors, volunteers, those who are present here, and of course, uh, across the Zoom webinar. It is a collective effort to discover new knowledge and solutions that allow us to better manage the rising rate of dementia and depression, not just among the seniors, but also uh, across the uh, population not just in Singapore, but globally, especially during recent pandemic. And this is important because it will help us improve the quality of life and reduce disease burden on families and the community. As the program H12 Every Day uh, gets refreshed with new translational findings, we are excited to see the impact we can make in the areas of active aging and dementia prevention. We are emerging from the pandemic into a world that has not only been changed by COVID-19, but we are also facing increasing threat from economic and political or even security challenges in some part of the world, which has spilled over effect to us. To manage these changes well, it can uh, place high demands uh, and extort uh, individual um, and cause them to be stressed, both stretched in their own capacity and ability to cope, uh, and even as we adapt to the new norm. The My Science Centre has been driving translational research, developing community intervention programme to build emotional resilience and optimise cognitive performance across life trajectory to build an undefeated mind. Innovating mind health with biological and social science that shapes our understanding of the complex function of human brains will also help to provide policy maker with new insights to create fresh opportunities to support individuals, families and organisations in building and sustaining mental capital and good mental health. I would like to thank everyone who has been involved in one way or another with My Science Centre, all of you are catalysts in our journey. I would also like to express our gratitude to Mr. Do Heng Tan and your family for your generous donation to establish the Do Tian Seng Distinguished Lecture Series in honour and memory of your father to advance the knowledge and science of mental wellness. To all our distinguished donors, we are most grateful for your support in a purposeful journey of building an undefeated mind in the community. We look forward to your continued support uh, in this journey and partnership with My Science Centre. We would also like to especially thank Senior Minister Teo for taking time to grace this occasion to mark the milestone of h Well Everyday Programme and officiate the book launch in memory of the patron of My Science Centre, Mrs. Teo Boin, a pioneer and advocate in this collective journey. So with this, I thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this afternoon's uh, presentation that is coming up shortly. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Prof Wong. May I invite you back to your seat? 
Okay, it is our hope that today's event can be a leap forward into achieving Mind Science Center's mission to build a resilient, uh, build resilience across all ages, a community with an undefeated mind. Now, may I please invite Senior Minister and Coordinating Minister for National Security, Mr. Dio Jihan, on stage to give his opening address. And let's welcome Senior Minister with a round of applause. Thank you. slightly higher. <laughs> Dr. Chong, my colleague, Mr. Abdullah Tamogi, Professor Chong Kep Singh, Associate Professor John Wong, uh, Professor Rati, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to join you today for the third, for the fifth Tao Tiang Singh Distinguished Lecture and the launch of the NUS Mind Science Center's new book. Aging with Dignity, which raises awareness about positive aging and dementia prevention in Singapore. Dementia is a growing problem around the world. According to the World Health Organization, there are currently more than 55 million people living with dementia worldwide, with nearly 10 million new cases every day. Dementia is currently the seventh leading cause of death among all diseases and one of the major causes of disability and dependency among the elderly globally. Here in Singapore, one in 10 seniors aged 60 and above has dementia. With increased life expectancy now well into the 80s and our aging population, we expect the number of people with this condition to increase. It's therefore critical to raise awareness of dementia and increase support for persons with the condition and their caregivers. We want to build an inclusive society in which persons with dementia are understood, respected, supported, and well integrated in our community and are able to lead purposeful and meaningful lives. Since 2012, the government has been strengthening our support for mental health care, including dementia, under our Community Mental Health Master Plan. We have launched health campaigns to raise awareness and reduce stigma of dementia and to encourage Singaporeans to seek help early if they detect related signs and symptoms, either among themselves or among those whom they care for. In addition, we have worked with community care partners to establish community outreach teams and intervention teams to provide greater support to those living with the condition as well as they are caregivers. We are also working with our primary and community care providers, including nursing homes, to improve their capability and capacity for dementia care management. The government greatly values the contributions of our partners, like the NUS Mind Science Centre, which has done important work in building mental resilience among Singaporeans and helping our elderly to live with dignity, meaning, and hope. The book that we are launching today documents the Mind Science Center's Age Well Every Day, or AWE program, which is the first dementia prevention program in Asia. When my late wife, Poyim, first mooted the idea in August 2014, she was trying to challenge the team working on the Jurong Aging Study for Dementia Prevention to consider the transnational importance of their research and to extend the benefits to other seniors in Singapore. Since then, it has grown into a nationwide program with a group of passionate and determined philanthropists and medical experts who aim to strengthen our understanding of dementia and develop strategies for early detection and to tackle risk factors. Combining health education mindfulness practice, art, music, horticultural therapy, and physical activities, the program is designed to delay cognitive deterioration, reduce anxiety, and increase sociability, and 
in so doing, help to delay the onset of dementia and improve the quality of life of our seniors. I'm pleased that there are now eight centres running the AWE programme. The programme is well loved by our seniors, who regard it as a valuable platform to spread their social connectedness, be involved in the community, raise their self-esteem and live with dignity. The programme has trained more than 110 volunteers to bring the programme to a wider audience. Through the AWE e-learning training centre launched in 2018, more than 8,000 individuals have enrolled and benefited from various self-help preventive healthcare modules offered in both English and other languages. This will enable more learners to become more active volunteers in the community. The NUS Mind Science Centre and AWE program always had a special place in Poem's heart. I never knew exactly what she was doing, but I knew she spent quite a lot of time and energy on it. She would tell me, don't disturb me. <laughs> For the next couple of hours, I have this thing to do. So I said, okay, you just carry on, please. <laughs> She fervently believed in your mission and your work in helping both the young and elderly to develop perspectives on aging and in the potential to transform the lives of people through rigorous evidence-based research and structured community programs. She was always very outcome driven. So she said, what's the evidence and how can we make this work better? I know she would be immensely proud of what the NUS Mind Science Centre and the AWE program have achieved. My family and I thank the NUS Mind Science Centre, the editors, Professor Kwai Hock and Associate Professor Rati Pendran, our contributors, publisher, writer editions, and many others who have come together to produce this book. We are honoured that the book has been dedicated in the memory of Poe. I also look forward to the fifth Tao Tiang Singh Distinguished Lecture by Professor Kua Yi Hock, which will trace the genesis of the AWE program and provide new insights into the significance and meaning of living with dignity. I'm confident that the book and all your good work will strengthen our collective knowledge about mental health and dementia and help us build a more inclusive and supportive society where our seniors can live happier, healthier, and more dignified lives. And on this Mother's Day, I take the opportunity to wish all mothers a happy Mother's Day, and that we remember all our mothers, those of us, those of them who are with us, and those who are no longer with us as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Senior Minister. Can I invite you to the center of the stage for the book launch? May I also invite Dr. Cheong Chung Kong, Chairman of Mind Science Center, Professor Kwa Yi Hyuk, and also Associate Professor Rati Mahendran up on stage for the book launch. Okay, are you, are you ready? <laughs> uh, I say one, two, three. Okay, one, two, three. Let us commemorate the launch of this book with a round of applause. Oh. Okay, may I now invite uh, Professor Chong Yap Singh, Dean of NUS Yong Lulian School of Medicine, to present a token of appreciation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> May I invite Dr. Chong to first present a copy of the book to our guest of honor? Oh, the book first. Oh, I'm very sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. 
Okay, very sorry about that. May I now invite uh, Professor Chong Yap Singh, Dean of NUS Young Lulin School of Medicine, to present a token of appreciation to Senior Minister, Mr. Tio Chi Hien. Written by 79 years old, Mr. Kung Chun Singh, the Chinese character Su, which comprises the brain and heart, symbolizes Mind Science Center's mission to advance the science in mind health to serve the community from our heart. Okay, thank you. Let us now take a group photo. Okay, thank you so much everyone. May I invite you back to your seats to enjoy a short video on a beautiful song on the environment sung by the senior choir from Jurong who participated in the study on dementia prevention. The lyrics were written uh, by Professor Kwa I Hyok and the song was composed by Mr. Chuang, a teacher who had suffered from depression and has since recovered. Uh, please enjoy the video. For the next segment, Professor Kwa I Hyok will be delivering his keynote lecture for the fifth To Tiang Seng Distinguished Lecture. Professor Kwa I Hyok is a Tan Gyok Kin professor in psychiatry and neuroscience at NUS and emeritus consultant at NUH. His early education was at High School Batu Pahat and Muar in Malaysia. He graduated as a doctor from the University of Malaya in 1973 and was in national service with the Malaysian Army as captain in the medical corps. Soon after, he left for England and was awarded a three-year scholarship to study psychiatry at Oxford. After just two and a half years, he passed the specialist exam of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and was promoted to associate consultant and later consultant. However, his wife did not like the cold, wet English weather and persuaded him to move back to Singapore on Boxing Day 1980 with their one-year-old daughter, Jade. Two days later, at MOH, after an interview of just 10 minutes, he was offered a job but was told that at 32 years old, he was too young to be a consultant in Singapore and should start as a registrar, a junior specialist. 
After working a year at Woodbridge Hospital, he was invited to join NUS, and in 1984, he won a scholarship from the Rockefeller Foundation in New York for training in geriatric psychiatry at Harvard. After that, he was invited by the WHO team to join the Global Study of Dementia, and later he was invited by the UN in New York to speak at the World Forum on Depression. In 1999, the Minister of Health appointed him CEO and Medical Director of Woodbridge. He decided to rebrand the hospital as the Institute of Mental Health. Prof Kwa has won many international research prizes, published 350 research papers and 30 books on mental health, aging, stress, and addiction. His first novel, Listening to Letter from America, is used in a course on anthropology at Harvard. Currently, Prof Kwa also serves as the vice chairman of the Mind Science Center. Let us welcome Prof Kwa on stage with a round of applause. Thank you, Maureen. The Honorable Senior Minister, Mr. Tio Chi Hien, um, Dr. C.K. Chong, Chairman of the Mind Science Center, Mr. Abdullah Tamugi, former Speaker of Parliament, um, Professor Chong Yap Singh, Dean of Medicine, friends, we have got one more, uh, Mr. Do Hing Tan, the benefactor of the Tao Tian Sing Distinguished Lecture Series, friends and colleagues. I understand there are many uh, listening in from outside of Singapore, as far north as uh, China, Malaysia, and south in Indonesia, and also in Australia. And a couple of friends from North America are also listening in. It is a beautiful Sunday afternoon here in Singapore. And before I give the lecture, I would like to say a few words about the late Mr. Tao Tian Singh. I have not met him, and I'm told by his son that he belonged to the pioneer generation and came to Singapore before the Second World War. He worked as a waiter for the British Merchant Navy and later the Dutch Royal Shell Company. And he imbued in his children a, a sense of filial piety, social responsibility, and also generosity. I'm glad to announce that these virtues are within the repertoire of the personality of his son, Mr. Tao Hing Tan, who is um, most supportive of the Mind Science Center and also has started a, a charity fund called Mind the Gap 200 for mental health. There are in NUS many research programs which are of translational relevance, meaning that the programs impacted the lives of people in the community. And one of these pro interesting program is the HWL Everyday Program. It is the first program in Asia on dementia prevention, a non-drug approach. And here in Singapore, as the senior minister had mentioned, there are eight centers impacting the lives of over 3,000 elderly people. And it has been selected for presentation in the World Congress of Psychiatry in August. In the world, there are four centers doing research on dementia prevention. Besides our center, the center in Paris, in Finland, in Japan. And it's a feather on our cap that the Mind Science Center HWL Everyday Program has been selected. And one of the reasons being that this program is on a shoestring budget. And um, it comes, the donation comes mainly from many of our colleagues and friends who are in this room and also listening in. And we also have many volunteers, many of whom are in this room and also listening in the webinar. And this is a federal cap again. There's something that is achieved. And World Health is often looking for programs which are um, which can be applicable to 
other countries in, in Africa, South America, and these are cost-effective studies. But many people do not know that the HVL Everyday Program is in fact the, the brainchild of Mrs. Dio Po Yim, who came to a lecture I delivered at the Shangri-La Hotel on the 20th of August, 2014. And um, she told me that this study on this project at Jurong cannot just remain at Jurong. The seniors in other parts of Singapore must also benefit from this program. And she invited us to attend a meeting at the headquarters of the People Association at Jalan Besar. And there we met Senior Minister Lim Boon Heng, three other mayors, and six other members of parliament who were very impressed with this program. And one of the, the, the reasons being that the, the evidence base the, uh, that we have from the research at Jurong. And I'll talk about this, this study. And what she mentioned to all of them was the hallmarks of the HVL Everyday Program. And Mrs. Steele mentioned that it is evidence-based, it's a structured program, and there is a measurable outcome. And so I'll tell you a bit on the evidence-based uh, uh, research. It was conducted at Jurong and you see that it started in 2012. And just after two years, the editor of the distinguished medical journal called The Lancet told us that we should write a report in The, in the, in the Lancet because he told us to wait for five years or 10 years is too long. You must tell the world what's happening. You know? And um, what we did was to do a study at the Jurong Point shopping mall. This is the first time in Singapore or even Asia, that a research team is anchored in a shopping mall. So although it started at 2012, the idea germinated in 2002. It took us 10 years, it's a long and winding road, and mainly because we couldn't get anyone to support us. There was no funding um, from anyone. In fact, in one of the agencies that I went to, the lady asked me, have the Americans done it? I said, no. I gave a lecture in Harvard before, and I said, no, nobody in America has done it. And then she asked me, so how do you know it will be successful? I told her, it doesn't mean that if the Americans have not done it, then we can't do it, and um, it will be a failure. And I said, we are doing research in the frontiers of research in terra incognita, no man's land. You know? And we should never feel intellectually inferior to anyone. It is a new, interesting idea. And I'm very glad that um, some friends came, came on board to help us out. Uh, Mr. Lee Sun Tech for the Lee Kim Ta family told me that, come to my shopping mall. You know. we'll, we'll pay or, or we will help you to renovate the place and to the tune of almost $300,000. And every year, he'll give us a donation for 10 years. And we have our partners in at Jurong Point is the uh, Presbyterian Community Service, and I'm Mr. David Lim is somewhere in the audience. And also, um, besides that, the Lee Kim, the the Kwan In Hoot Cho Temple, uh, Dr. Tan Chung Kim, gave us 1.8 million dollars. So what we did was, there are 50 blocks of flat around the, the Jurong Point shopping mall, and our nurses would knock on every flat. You know. It's a very tedious work. You know. Anyone above 60 years, we welcome down, them down to the Juno Point uh, Center. The center is called Training and Research Academy. It's a very big name, Training and Research Academy. We, we wanted to impress some of our visitors. In fact, two professors of medicine from Harvard came down to see us. You know. And um, coming to, to Jurong Point, the, the uh, assessment will be free. If, you, if, if the elderly comes down to my clinic at NUH, they'll, they'll pay NUH about $200. They'll pay too, too exorbitant. So at Jurong Point, it's free and also there's less of a stigma. And they are assessed very uh, uh, thoroughly by the doctors, by psychologists, and also the social health. And anyone with some memory problem will ask for a brain scan. So it's a very detailed assessment. 
And we wrote, know from our research of the World Health, and also we started a memory clinic in NUH 30 years ago, the, the data is massive. And from our data, we know that there is an association between hypertension, diabetes, and dementia. So from there, we asked all the elderly to come down, and those who are high risk. So this study is for people who have very high risk. They have some memory problem. They don't have dementia, but from our assessment, they have mild cognitive impairment. And even the people with depression, they don't have the full-blown uh, symptoms of depression. There's a mild symptom, subclinical depression and subclinical anxiety. So can we do something to prevent them from tipping over to de dementia or depression? The first part of the study is health education. So we'll tell them what is hypertension, what is diabetes, diet, exercise. And the second part, we divide them into four groups. One group we're doing Tai Chi, another group mindfulness, the third group music, and then art. So we allow them to choose whichever one they want to prefer. I was asked to give a lecture, or we were asked to give a lecture at Finland, one of the big centers. And the people in Finland were very uh, uh, impressed because they said, hey, there's something from Asia on mindfulness, on Tai Chi. The Scandinavian love something spiritual. So they said, this is something interesting. They told me, I wonder why some people in Asia want to come down to Finland to learn from us, because um, our program is very expensive. You know, we have, we've got to employ doctors, psychologists, but the Singapore program depends more on volunteers. And then, after a year, some of, the, some of the elderly will say, well, besides, besides uh, music, I may want to do something on mindfulness. So we allow them to select and choose. So, um, so you see that this is a, a, a very rigorous study. And um, there, are, there are many other programs that came along the way, including, uh, um, including gardening. However, working in NUS, I love the debate amongst the researchers. Sometimes they disagree with me, which is excellent. You know? So one of them told me that, well, this study is what I call a naturalistic study. Naturalistic study, meaning that people choose what they want to do. I said, this is life, isn't it? If I don't want to uh, uh, play golf, I don't want to play golf, I play tennis. But no, he said, in research, we must do a randomized controlled trial. That's the gold standard. The gold standard, ladies and gentlemen, is good for drug trial. But a psychosocial trial is very, very difficult. Well, having said that, they were never convinced. They said, we must do it RCT. So OK, so we select two, two uh, activities, mindfulness and health education. So for mindfulness, we had, at that time, the best trainer in mindfulness in the country, Mr. Wee Sinto. And for health education, 12 years ago, the best teacher at NUS of medical school was Professor Goli Gan. So the head to head, the best person in mindfulness, the best person in education. And we have two groups of seniors and find out what happened to them. Before they start the study, we scan the brain, MRI scanning the brain. And then after three months and after six months. So you see in this picture, there's increase in the um, the brain cells, the brain activities for both, for mindfulness and also health education. So health education is also very effective. But the outcome has been that mindfulness is a bit much better than compared to health education. The data have been published in, in the World's Journal. This is the first paper done on mindfulness in seniors. Most of the studies done on mindfulness on young people. So this amazing appeared also in the American newspaper. The rest of the, uh, the, the, there are eight more research papers, and they are all in the, in the book itself. The second one we did was to do something on the genetics. Before we, they start the study, we took some blood to, to check on the length of the telomeres. So these are, these are the chromosomes. Our, our genes are stored inside the chromosomes, and these are the telomeres, the tail. As we grow older, the telomeres become shorter and shorter, and just before we die, it ends up here and the whole chromosome opens up, the genes spill in the cell, and we perish. But you see in this study, the telomeres, instead of getting shorter, it becomes longer and longer for both. All right? But then what happened? Do they grow shorter and shorter again? Well, after the third month, we told them, why not we do it once a month instead of doing every week? This is weekly, 
This is monthly. In fact, you, you speak to uh, Mrs. We Gyok Hua, you do it daily for, for mindfulness. But let's study weekly and monthly. So if weekly is much more effective. The next study was uh, the idea of Professor Rati Mahindran, and she was saying that why not we find out what happened to gut bacteria? In our, back, in our gut or intestine, there are millions and millions of bacteria. There are good bacteria, there are bad bacteria. The bad bacteria causes fever, diarrhea. The good bacteria causes a secretion of a neurotransmitter called serotonin, good for the brain. So this study is very interesting, and the first part, study in the world done on mindfulness and the microbiome, the, the gut bacteria. There's also another study on, um, on the immune system of the body, and it's done by um, Dr. Ng Keng Xiang, a Malaysian researcher who is now in North America. After that, we also have other studies on, on music reminiscence, and Mr. Tristan Gui is sitting down there as our lead researcher, and also another study um, on choir singing. Choral singing was the idea of Dr. Maureen Sarkok, our previous professor of obstetrics, and uh, together with uh, Professor Bernard Lansky for the Yong Sinto Conservatory of Music, and also Darius Lim, and the lead researcher is Dr. Feng Lei from China. And what they did was interesting was, besides um, assessing their, their mental health, they also scanned the brain at zero time, and after three, three years, after uh, uh, one year and two years. So this is the first study in the world on choir singing, on choral singing, whether it can delay the onset or prevent dementia. And, and it attracted a lot of attention from people in, in North America. They came down from Boston to see what we're doing here, and also from London. So this is a very interesting study. I have no time to run through the, uh, the, uh, the results. It's also in the book itself. The next study is on art, and, um, and the lead researcher is Professor Mahindran again. And, um, but the person who gave the idea um, was none other than our ambassador at large, Professor Tommy Koh. So Professor Tommy Koh rang me one day and said, hey, there's a, a report in the New York Times that they're doing a study on art for patients with dementia. And asked me, are you interested? Um, he said, well, I told you I'll think about it. He said, well, you're interested, let me know, because at that time, Professor Tomiko was chairman of the National Arts Council. He said, I can make arrangements for the museum, art museum, to help you out. I happened to be in New York about the same time, and a friend of mine knew the, the chief executive of, of the Museum of Modern Art, where the study was, in, was done. And I visited the place uh, with some friends, and I saw them doing this, this study, and they had paintings, original paintings of Pablo Picasso, Vincent van Gogh. So when I came back, I wrote a note to Professor Cole and said, well, I, I think it's an interesting study, but we should make it better than Americans. You know? They've got patients, people with dementia, but we are going to have people who are before the dementia phase, uh, people who are high risk, the preclinical, pre-dementia phase. And also we are going to do brain scan, which they haven't done in, in, uh, in North America and then see that what happened to them. And once again, this, this study was conducted at the uh, National Gallery. We're very glad uh, for the people in the National Gallery. And uh, together, the, the, the gallery here in NUS, and we trained the docents. And one of the, the, the people helping us out was our art therapist, Mr. Wong Litsun, who is listening now. Um, let me see. So after um, uh, a year, we published the data, and once again, these are some of the studies, the wonderful studies that is done uh, on art therapy that's using biological markers. So as you see, all these studies, the whole study is, is, is colossal, it's huge, you know. In fact, it took a toll on the last, on the last press vestige of my youth. And I used to look <laughs> much younger than uh, Dr. Uh, Professor John Wong, and, and now I've aged so much after the, the, the study completed, you know. Um, but it's a wonderful study and I enjoy it. Um, and it is an interventional study. The editor of Nature, the prestigious journal, came to Singapore before the pandemic. And he invited me for coffee, he heard about this study. And he said, this is what the world should be doing, you know, intervention. He said, I received lots of, of papers from people telling me about the prevalence of dementia, the prevalence of depression so much. He told me, so what with all this prevalence? Can you bring it down? 
Can you bring the 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 the, the, uh, the depression rate down? That's what we want to know, you know. And so this this study is is, uh, is something that excites lots of people. And after five years, this is what we found. Um, you see that at zero time, the beginning of the study, the prevalence of de depression is almost eight percent, and then after five years, it's gone down. The anxiety about one point six, and, and here. Dementia rate, beginning was almost 2%, now it's 3%. Our researchers from Australia tell me that if you have 2%, after five years, it should be 6%, because age is a risk factor for dementia. As you grow older, the prevalence will increase. And so for this, the expected prevalence should be 6%, but now it's only 3%. Now, the depression rate is very important because we have spent millions and millions of dollars training more doctors, more psychiatrists, more psychologists, but the suicide rate is still high. I mean, you know. Sometime in 1995, um, the National Institute of Health in America sent me a note and asked me, would you like to join a big research, a global study on suicide? I said, sure, we'd like to join in the Singapore study. And we found that to to our alarm that the suicide rate for elderly Chinese men was 62 per 100,000, the second highest in the world. It was very alarming. Um, and then we spoke to the people, the Ministry of Health. We did many things. And the more day centers done, uh, are built, and the more training for staff, more public talks given about depression and how to detect them. And the rate went down from 62 to just about 45, you know. And this is the first time in the world that suicide rates have been brought down. Um, we were invited to, to give a lecture at Chicago, and we told them the data, and it was amazing. The Americans said, this is fantastic, you know. But now it has gone up again. It's almost reaching 60. This is very alarming, you know. Um, and, uh, before the pandemic, I was all asked on, on the CNA television, um, what, I said, what can we do now? It's still going up. You know? I said, well, we are doing a study uh, at that time in Jurong, and, and I think the, uh, if we can control the depression rate, depression is the mortality, that is suicide, that will be wonderful. Right? So there's something that we, we can do. Now, um, the H12 everyday program is not static. You know, it's moving on, it's organic, you know, right? Um, and we, we absorb lots of ideas from people around us. And I was telling a friend last week that if we don't have, we don't have any new ideas, in Singapore, if we don't have any new ideas, Singapore will perish. You know? We need to have new ideas to help us in our research, improve the quality of life of people. Some years ago, some 15 years ago, I was invited to give a lecture at Cambridge. And I met um, a professor of economics. And he asked me, what are the factors which account for the economic miracle of Singapore? And I told him the success of Singapore is because of two factors in the human mind, creativity and mental resilience, new ideas. And, and you, you will go to difficult times, like the pandemic. You have to overcome this, this, this kind of situation. And the ideas for the research don't just come from scientists. And the next study comes from Mr. Uh, Mr. Lin Boon Heng. We are together in, um, in a, set, a webinar. In a webinar, uh, in, a, in a seminar organized by the Chinese Women Association on aging in place. So Mr. Lim was telling people what we must do, but then he whispered to me and said, we don't have any data, you know. We don't, can you all do some studies? So we had done a, a study uh, on, on um, aging in place. Um, the two people have, helping us out. There's uh, Professor uh, Wilson Tam and Vivian Wu, they're all in the audience, and also uh, Tang Ling Ling. I think this study is to find out how we can build up bonding within the family. And if it's bonding the family, then there's a higher chance that the, person, the, the children be want to look after the elderly. 
Last week, I saw a student um, in the university and he was having depression and, and, uh, and suicidal ten tendency. And I asked him, what does your father do? He said, my father is an engineer. Where does he work? I don't know. What does your mother do? My mother is an accountant. Where does he work? I think it's in the bank. You know. So I asked him, don't you all eat together at night? No, I eat in my room. You know. What do you think are the chances of this person want to, want to take care of the parents when they grow old, they don't know each other? Some years ago, many years ago, I was the vice dean of medicine. I was in charge of the admission of JC student to medicine. And the students have an idea that, oh, the chairman of that committee is Dr. Pua, you know. And they came to see me and said, can we do a study with you on aging? I said, we don't want to do anything too high for Latin for all of you, all JC students. You're going to find out from your class how many are staying the grandparents or they visit the grandparents often. And we find out that this group of people who live with their parents or visit their grandparents often, they are more eager to look after their own parents when they grow old. In contrast to another group of students who don't live with their grandparents, who hardly visit their grandparents, the idea of aging is what they see sometimes on television. Frailty, you know, old people in old people's homes. To them, that's burden. That's a burden to them. You know. So they told me that, well, it's a burden, it's the government's problem, not our problem. So these people are not too eager to take care of, of, of the elderly, or the elderly parents. So you see that um, this kind of study is very important and I think uh, Professor Wilson Tam will be probably extending to the community. The second study is by uh, Professor um, Shifali Sholi, who's sitting here, uh, on where there is no psychiatrist. If you do a study in, in Singapore, we know that the prevalence of depression is about almost about 7, 10%. 10% means that there are 50,000 cases. How are we gonna manage 50,000 cases of depression? If you, if you intend to make an appointment, anyone who, to see Professor John Wong, it's three months. It's overwhelming. So there must be a different way to, to tackle the problem. So what Dr. Shifale is doing is, to whether we can train retired teachers, or even servicemen, some simple techniques on psychological first aid, and they can manage them. And the more difficult cases, they escalate to the specialty to see. You cannot have 50,000 coming down to the place. It's impossible. You know? So these are the interesting studies that we are, we are doing. So you see that the study is not just about basic science. You know, about brain cells, about uh, uh, MRI scanning, but also clinical medicine and also the social sciences. All right? And also, um, this study is, uh, I mentioned to you that um, if you look at this, the name of this study is called Community Health and Intergeneration Study, CHI. And this, this uh, title is given by Mrs. Teo. Mrs. Teo Poin is, is someone who's not only creative, innovative, a sense of humor, you know, as some, and as we have an endearing memory of her. And um, so the study is not just about changing behavior, but also changing values. I gave a talk in North America, and I told them we're doing a study. They told me that changing behavior is not difficult, but changing values is very, very difficult. And I agree. I told them it's difficult. Let's try it. You know, changing behavior is not difficult. We, if you don't wear masks, the government will find you, you know, right? People wear masks, you know. But you tell them, can you look after your, your, grand, your parents? Do you thank or smile at the cleaners in the hospital? So these are things that maybe we can do them cheap by improvement. So you see the ideas grow along the way. And the next one is on something that's very interesting on the, the green urbanism. Uh, we, we worked hand in glove with the people at national parks. Um, and we started off uh, the therapeutic uh, gardens, which is now available in about eight centers around Singapore. And it's also a research paper published in Nature on the study. Uh, Angela Sia is from N Parks and uh, doing a PhD. And it stirred up a lot of interest you know, uh, on, on people. Um, and if, in fact, um, after I finished the study, the, the CEO of, of N Parks told me, well, you spend a lot of time with all of us. Um, can we ask you to plant a tree? You know? So I said, okay, that would be a great honor. I said, what tree would you like to plant? She thought I would ask for a, a durian tree. You know? <laughs> so I said, no, I'm asking for a nutmeg tree. He said, 
nutmeg. Why nutmeg? I said, why not nutmeg? So I told him that 500 years ago, 500 years ago, there was a pandemic in Europe called the Black Death due to the bubonic plague. And there was no cure. And someone said, the cure is from the Jews of the nutmeg. 500 years ago. And then the Portuguese came down first. Vasco da Gama down, rounded the Cape of Good Hope and reached India. And then an, a, a, a Portuguese admiral, Alfonso de Abaque, sailed across the Bay of Bengal, came down to Malacca. The conquest of Malacca was in 1511. Immediately after the conquest of Malacca, he sent two ships to look for the Malucas Island where the nutmeg was grown. And after the, 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 Portug the Portuguese came, the Dutch, and then the English. And that's how we're all here speaking English. Now, after all this has been done, I was invited for, for uh, lunch by the uh, chairman of NPUPS, Mr. Benny Lim, and um, Mr. Abdullah Tamgi was down there also, and he asked me, any other new ideas? Well, I told him that we should do something interesting on the rainforest. We should get a group of people to walk through the rainforest and find out, us, find out about the physical, mental health, and the social health. You know? And we found that very interesting data from there. You found that these people began to care for one another, walking to the rainforest, a sense of empathy and compassion. So now, especially now in the pandemic, you know, there are few people in that study who are widows and widowers. So their friend will say, can I help to buy the groceries for you? Can I help to get medicine for you in the hospital? So there's a sense of compassion. You know. And um, I and I also noticed that they, they began to love the rainforest, you know, uh, because the, we also asked the, uh, the uh, chairman of the end parks to get someone to follow us. Every time we, we walk through the rainforest, you see some beautiful trees. We have the faintest idea what's the name of this tree. You know? Even of some of us who drive along the roads in Singapore, the beautiful trees. What's the name? We don't even know, you know. So this person will come along with us and tell us what's the medicinal uh, value of this tree, what's the name of this tree. So the, the people began to de develop a, a love for the trees. And at the end of the study, they donated 60 trees as part of the One Million Tree Project of National Parks. This is tremendous, you know, um, this kind of response. I presented some of the data in the international conference, and the chairman of that uh, symposium was a chap from Brazil. He told me, this is a marvelous study. He told me that do you know that Amazon rainforest is about 20 to 30,000 times the, same, the size of Singapore and people are burning it down? The deforestation is one of the causes of global warming. Is that Singapore can play a role, but you tell people this study, more people will want to will love the rainforest or not do anything to destroy it. Some of you may not know that two, only two cities in the world with a rainforest in the city, Singapore and Rio de Janeiro. So you're hoping that we can publish this data and get it on to tell people about what we're doing. And it's picked up very fast because uh, after the, the paper was published, um, we got a phone call from um, the World Congress and they said, you should come and share with people and tell people what we can do um, to prevent global warming. You know, in a, the role we play is very small. you know. And I think they told me, you the people from Singapore should be able to speak up. I think a lot of times with things that we've done well, we're sometimes a bit more diffident. I'm not too sure why. A good example is the life expectancy. The life expectancy in Singapore is 84 years. North America is 79, England 81. So someone asked me, why is that you're still asking a lot of foreigners to come to Singapore to teach you people about aging? When you people should be going across to, uh, to Europe and North America talk about longevity. You know? So I think something for us, maybe Singaporean, not too sure whether the minister will agree with me that we are maybe low self-esteem. That um, Someone said, oh, it's a colonial mentality. We, are, we have been independent 57 years now. So this, this project will be uh, presented in the World Congress also. Um, about 20 years ago, the, the, um, the tsunami struck Aceh. You know? And the uh, Indonesian government assembled a team for the mental health response to help the, vip, the, the victims. The chief of psychiatry from Jakarta sent me a note, can you join this team to, to help out? So I certainly would like to help out. And they told me that, do you know that although the, the tidal wave destroyed Aceh, 
certain parts of the beach is, was still intact because of the mangrove swarms. The mangroves from a deep roots. And behind the mangrove stump were the rainforests. The rainforests also had deep roots, so the, they were not never destroyed by the, uh, by the, by the uh, tsunami. There's something very interesting about the kind of, uh, uh, of the, how the trees grow together, the roots cling together and prevent them from destruction. I love to go to the National Gallery and, um, with my grandkids, and there's also a place there called the Capital Room for the kids to do some drawing. This is what they, they did. They did a drawing, and they see the trees, the rainforest, the trees are clinged together. And something of a, a metaphor for, for, I think, for the community, that we are like rainforests, you know, we, we, um, we cling together, and there's something wonderful uh, uh, that we can, as a, as a symbol, a metaphor of, of solidarity. I know in the audience is the director from, from, uh, from uh, People Association and also Thomas somewhere, also PA. And if the PA wants to change the logo to something more inspiring, this can be a good, a good logo for you to go into. All right. And I want to announce that um, a friend of mine, a writer and a poet, um, Mr. Ko Bak Song, has just released a new book uh, called One United People. And you'll recognize it's a line taken from National Pledge. And I'm amazed because he has included the Age Well Everyday Program into one of the chapters of this book. When the Age Well Everyday Program was first started, it was conceived as a platform for dementia prevention. But now it's also perceived as a platform to unite the community. One united people needs the vision of people who pays the corridors of power to lead us. It needs the imagination of builders and planners to lay the foundation. It needs the, uh, the creativity of writers, poets, musicians, and artists to touch the soul of the nation. And it needs the humanity of people like Mrs. Theo Po Im, who could empathize with the universality of our feelings, to grow old with dignity. She enlightened us by her insights, stirred us by her commitment, and inspired us by her dedication. The success of the Age Well Everyday Program is a fulfillment of her purpose-driven life. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Kwa. You can please remain on stage first. Okay, our guest of honor, Senior Minister and Kennedy Minister for National Security, Mr. Tio Chihen, will be taking his leave first. On behalf of the Mind Science Center, I would like to express our greatest gratitude, the Senior Minister, for officiating our latest book, Aging with Dignity. Okay, uh, Prof. Ko, may I invite you to your seat for the panel discussion? And may I also invite our panelists, uh, Associate Professor Shefali Shori, Mr. Abdul Rashid Ibrahim, and Mrs. Wee Kokwa, as well as our moderator, Associate Professor Rati Mahendra, to come on stage for the panel discussion.
So um, good afternoon, everyone. I think we had a wonderful lecture from Prof Kwa just now, and there's nothing more to be said about the Age Well <laughs> Everyday Program. He's covered everything. But, but I think importantly, apart from that very structured uh, program on cognitive stimulating activities, um, what's equally important uh, in the success of that program has been the trainers, the expert trainers, uh, as well as the volunteers who have committed their time and effort in delivering the program on the ground. And today we are really um, lucky to have three um, panelists, all of whom have not only helped in the research behind those programs, uh, but they have uh, functioned as expert trainers, and they continue to volunteer on the ground as well. So uh, let's hear from them. We can get them to share their experience. And the first panelist is uh, Mrs. Wee. Uh, Hua, who together with her late husband, Mr. Wee Sin To, helped us in the research on mindfulness awareness practice. And that was way back in 2012 itself. Um, since then, she, uh, she and her husband, they were training uh, volunteers. They prepared the Mandarin translation of the instructions. And I would like to invite her first to share her experience on this journey. This is Wee. Thank you very much, Prof Rati, and thank you for being here, being Mother's Day and taking your time off in the afternoon. Um, within the time I'm given, so let me allow me to quickly touch on a couple of points. First, what is the mindfulness training all about? And for we as trainers, what do we do with our instructors? And what are some of the interesting outcomes um, of the program? Now. So what is mindfulness practice? It is a practice. It is not something that is random. It is the um, intention to pay attention, to attend to whatever that is happening right in front of you. And here, we pay attention to bodily sensations, we pay attention to feelings, we pay attention to thoughts and the mental processes. And together with that, the, all the other related uh, sensory stimulation and sensory experiences. When do we pay attention? We pay attention to what is happening now, in the here and now, in the present, not the past, not the future. Okay. And Paying attention, not just in that one moment or one point in time, but in the process. So it is paying attention moment to moment in the present. And what kind of attitude do we take when you pay attention, when you attend to something that is happening? It is a mind of non-judgmental mind, unbiased mind, simply being aware. So that's what we put our... our uh, uh, instructor volunteers through. So after the online program and the on-site program, we send them down to the, they go back to the community centers because all these volunteers come from the community centers. And then whilst they, they conduct their program, we as trainers will be there in the initial stage to mentor, to provide guidance, and to give them the confidence to continue with conducting the classes. Now. In the early stage, when we were trying to um, put together the core structure for MAP, Mindful Awareness Practice, in which my husband was, my late husband was very involved, we were looking at materials from the West, namely the CBT, Cognitive Based Therapy, and also the MBSR. Uh, some of you may be familiar, MBSR, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction, is um, made famous by Dr. John kabat -Zinn. And uh, going through all the materials, thrashing through the materials, we realized that the materials were not suitable for our community because our seniors come from different dialect groups, Chinese, Malay, Indians. Taking wholesale from the Western literature is not suitable for us. So we put in tremendous effort in trying to distill the core essence of the mindfulness practice itself, the way it's been taught in, in, in the West, and trying to ensure that 
without losing the essence, we will be able to use the material to train our instructor and then for them to be able to deliver it at the level of the community with our seniors. Not forgetting that our seniors at this stage, uh, people in their 60s up to their 80s in some centres, they have spent a big part of their life trying to put food on the table. They don't have time to sit around and watch set waterly sensations and so on and so forth. By making it very simple, without losing any of the essence, and then watching the feedback coming from this program, we were very encouraged. The program is, the main core program is for six sessions, followed by uh, 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 another six, and um, later on, those who are interested in uh, continuing would then go on to uh, do the, what we call interest group, a focus interest group. So if they're interested in mindfulness, they will have a group doing mindfulness, uh, exercise, and so on and so forth. What is very heartening for us is that the um, participants who've gone through the program, generally, they feel a lot happier. They are um, more contented with their situations. And remember that nothing has changed outside of them. Training allows them to change their own perspective and the way they look at life, the way they look at relationships. So there is understanding because by observing their bodily sensations and so on, there is an acceptance of how they function, how they react, and with that, it creates that spaciousness within their own mind for them to then change the perception and using that to look at others. With the acceptance, they are able to then let go of the clinging for a certain desired outcomes which they are looking for. And with that, contentment sets in. They are much happier. They have lesser problems with their health. There is less demand for attention from within the family because they are happy attending the classes. They are happy with themselves, how they are looking at life. Okay? So this is a very... Um, positive outcome for us. It is very encouraging for us as, as trainers. And uh, it keeps us going. It is a feedback loop for us. That what we are doing, the, the course material and structure which we have come up with is working. And that is important because this is the first time we are using materials customized for our own local community who speaks different dialect, religion, religion, and so on and so forth, right? And from there, interest was generated also then for the Chinese-speaking community. How do we reach out to them? So one of the centers, Kong San Po they translated the teaching materials into Mandarin. And uh, Queenstown also has a Mandarin program going on. And later on, uh, Tampanese Changkat, Rashid and his team attended the course and found that it was worthwhile for them to translate it into Malay for the Malay community. So for me, my role as a volunteer trainer, uh, it has been very, very uh, heartwarming and uh, it keeps us going because this is our own way of cont contributing back to the community, helping our seniors to live a uh, better quality life, early intervention, non-drug, delaying the onset of dementia for long, as long as we can, five years, 10 years. We just have to imagine the impact on their family, the community as such. The numbers themselves may not be interesting, 2,005, 3,000 over over how many years that we have the program running, it may not be interesting. But translate that into, not individuals, absolute numbers, translate that into families. Each number represents, let's say, a family of four. We can imagine the outreach that is happening right now. Okay. So thank you very much. I will okay. end uh, my sharing here. Yeah. So.
Thank you, uh, Mrs. V. That was really inspiring. Um, next, we go on to Mr. Abdul Rashid bin Ibrahim, who was instrumental in leading the translation, as Mrs. Uh, we uh, mentioned just now, the translation of the AWE program into the Malay language. And he has also introduced the use of smartphones in the program delivery at Tampines, Changkat CC, and soon also at Pongol CC. So, uh, Mr. Rashid, yeah. Thank you, Prof. Uh, first, we couldn't be more proud in Tampines Changkat for being the first in this region to conduct this program in a Malay language. It all started when I attended uh, a workshop in the Venture Program conducted by NUHS, Prof. Kwa and team. Uh, it was in, done in uh, Tampines Changkat CC that time. We were then given the challenge by Prof. Kwa to translate the given notes prepared by Prof. Go Li Gan and made simple by the late Mrs. Teo Chi Hien for an easier understanding as most of the notes were in medical terms. Without hesitation, I took up the challenge. As being a trainer during my regular army days, it gave me an advantage in using the skill to contribute to this exciting program. Due to COVID-19 affecting the world, it has been almost two years since we last met. With technology, we were then being given a task from NUHS to make up the lost time using handphone to reconnect with our elderly participants via WhatsApp. A difficult task initially for us as most of the participants range between 60 to 80 years of age, but with the help of our MAC youth, we managed to train them in batches within four consecutive weekends. A timeline of 12 weeks that began from 12 November 2021, we will then roll out the lessons via WhatsApp, and since then, we had also shared the notes with Pongol MAC for the engagement with elderly with this I end with my presentation. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Rashid. And uh, the next, our third speaker is Associate Professor Shafali Shawley, who many of you will recognize as the person who won the President's Award for Nurses 2021. She has been involved in research with the Mind Science Center for many years. And um, I'd like to invite her actually to share an interesting uh, research that she did and which Prof. Kwa mentioned <coughs> in his talk just now. So where there is no psychiatrist. Thank you very much, Prof. Rati, for your kind introduction. Good afternoon, distinguished guests. It's heartening to see so many of you present on a Sunday afternoon and on a Mother's Day. And uh, for me, it's a privilege to find a small space in this uh, book. And many thanks to Prof. Kwa. And I'll share with you a little story with your permission. But this, before that, it's also an honor to sit on this stage with the very experienced and celebrated individuals. So I'm going to share with you how I ended up uh, writing this chapter. In 2018, those who have ever received an email from Prof Kua, you know that he likes to address us with our initials. So I received an email and he said, hey, SS, do you want to come and see what's going on with the Age Well program? And rest is the history. I became a volunteer and then the trainer for the Age Well program. And that was the period when I got the privilege of learning about mindfulness from the master, late Mr. Vicento. During that period, we realized that a lot needs to be done for our community dwelling older adults. Many of them, they are suffering with subsyndromal, as Prof. Kua mentioned in his lecture, subclinical depression and anxiety. As we all know, mental health is a taboo topic in Asian context. So many of you, them, they don't even reach the radar of our health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists. We realize that something needs to be done, maybe training our volunteers so that they can support our Singaporean seniors. And that's when the name of this project started, which was Where There Is No Psychiatrist. So we trained lay volunteers, and they were trained by us health professionals. And then we delivered this intervention for a period of three months. What was unique about this program was that we took multimodal approach, which means we didn't really just focus on their mind. That means we introduced 
Brief Integrated uh, Personal Therapy, in short BIPT. We also introduce solution-focused approach. We also give them educational stuff, but most importantly, to take care of their language and emotions and body, we introduce <coughs> mindfulness. So this program was delivered um, one session, 90 minutes, over the period of three months on a weekly basis by a volunteer. And uh, in order to measure whether these, pro as Prof Kua said, right, that we have to prove the evidence. So we wanted to run a pilot randomized control trial before this program can be introduced to our seniors um, across Singapore. We started the program in November 29 with a lot of enthusiasm. And as you all know, early 2020, we all were hit with, with COVID-19. And in March 2020, abruptly, we have to stop the program. And we could only recruit uh, 21 uh, senior adults by then. And I'm proud to say that even though only 21 of them received this, where there's no psychiatrist in short WIPT program, but the results shows effectiveness in enhancing their quality of life. And we did just collect the data by a self-administered questionnaire. We also get biological data by measuring their hormones level, especially related to stress, to see how they do before and after uh, receiving this intervention. And most importantly, something which is very close to my heart, we also did interviews with these uh, individuals. We wanted to see how this program has helped them improve, especially their quality of life uh, during those three months. And like I said, that it has enhanced their quality of life. Even uh, blood samples, it shows that individuals who didn't receive the program, they had a higher levels of cortisol at six months down the road. So it shows that this program has potential, even though it was stopped abruptly. And also the qualitative data showed that the individuals, they liked the program. They said that the program is helpful and worth their time. We have published the study, which is now in chapter 16 in this beautiful book. And uh, I vividly remember when the program was running because you know it was with the, by the volunteers, I wanted to support them. So I used to you know, go to the community center very close here in the Western region where this program was introduced. And I vividly remember this participant who was uh, you know, part of this program, she came to me, held my hand and said, this program has given me meaning to live. I feel this powerful quote has shown us that a lot needs to be done for our older adults in the community. I'm a bit emotional because my parents are of this age and I feel with our collective efforts and, uh, uh, you know, the reach out to these older, ad uh, older adults, we can and will make a difference to their life. I'm very thankful to each and every one of you because I got to know that you are the donors. Because of you, these programs are possible. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Over to you, Prof. Rati. Okay. So thank you, uh, Prof. Pali. All right. So you have heard from the experts, trainers, and volunteers. Are there any questions uh, anybody has or would like to pose? There are mics on either side of the aisle. Are there any questions? So as you think about uh, what next to ask, maybe Prof Kwa, you could tell us a little bit about plans that we have for the Age Well Everyday program. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Before that, um, someone asked me earlier on at the um, foyer, uh, what happened to the uh, rainforest study? Uh, besides the seniors, we're going to extend to the university students. And uh, Rosalind is down there with Sean. They are in charge of it. We want to extend not only to NUS students, but also NTU, SMU, which extend to all the, uh, the universities. And from there, we go down to schools. You know? And so, so people will enjoy the rainforest. There's so much to learn in the rainforest. You walk the rainforest. You can ask um, Mr. Abdullah Tamugi. He's going to forest so often. Every week, he'll be down there. You know? yeah. <laughs> Living proof. You know? The other thing that someone asked me was uh, uh, the Chi study. I mentioned about the study that's headed by Professor Mahindran. It's a very unique study. This is the first time I've been to many centers around the world on study on aging. This is only a study in which you have all the disciplines of medicine inside there. So the study also included people doing eye. Uh, uh, ENT, Professor Wang is down there. You know, We have also um, cardiology. Orthopedic, and also uh, ENT, uh, uh, not the ENT, dent dentistry, and not also across the campus, people who are doing uh, uh, studies on nutrition, also part of this team, and also anthropologists are involved. You know. um, and we also have stretched across to other universities. Uh, for example, the reviewer of this book is someone in 
NTU, Professor Hong Hai, and also um, from SMU, uh, Professor Lim Su Pin, um, who is a previous Auditor General. Yeah. And we are thinking how we are going to um, uh, quantify the, 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 the outcome of this study, the cost benefit. And I'm very glad that Professor Houston Kwa, the economist, the, uh, the professor of economics from NTU, will be helping us to, to assess the, the, the cost benefit. You know. The future of, of this of the AW program, I think, it depends on um, where the people from people association. Right? Well, ah, Mr. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we had a long chat with Mrs. Mrs. Teo uh, Po Yim before she passed on. She was hoping that it extend to all the centers. Uh, and we're hoping also that uh, uh, the, the higher authorities will support us for that. So that's something that we're looking forward to. But also we need, uh, we also need volunteers to help out. And I'm very glad that the, that the, the volunteerism here is, is growing, you know. And uh, just to evoke a, a, a line from the old scripture, the harvest is plentiful, the workers few. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, uh, uh, hi, Prof. Rati. Uh, so uh, there are some questions oh. that will be online. So let me just um, sure. let, uh, ask the questions over here. So the first question we have from, the, from our webinar audience is Anna Leong. So she mentioned, thank you for sharing such a meaningful program. Please let us know how many people have gone through and what are the plans to allow more people to experience this program? So. A wonderful question with 3,000 people you know, uh, who have gone through the program now. And, uh, and once again, how in, in terms of, of sustainability and, and uh, uh, standing towards a, a bigger group of people is the, once again, the idea of Mrs. Teo Po Yim. She suggested, let us harness technology the online program. So we're extending online program across. Okay, so the next question, uh, we have an anonymous attendee who mentioned, besides mindfulness practice to acknowledge our bodily sensations, feelings and thoughts, how would the concept of non-attachment help in this aspect? Uh, Mrs. V, do you want to try and address, yeah. Okay. Can you just uh, can repeat you just the, repeat yeah, the question uh, slower a little bit? Okay, sure. Sorry. So, besides mindfulness practice to acknowledge our bodily sensations, feelings, and thoughts, how would the concept of non-attachment help in this aspect? Ah, uh, non-attachment is uh, is a different topic altogether. Yeah, depending on where you are coming from. Um, I presume the person is probably coming from the Eastern Buddhist tradition. The word non-attachment. Um, when we are doing the mindfulness practice, we're not talking about non-attachment. We, here we're talking about awareness. Awareness of the experience that is arising within the space in front of us or arising within the space within our own mind. So here we accept what is coming up, the states of mind we are going through, right? And looking at bodily sensation, being aware of the bodily sensations and the feelings that follow the bodily sensations, the thoughts and the mental processes, the person who's practicing it is like shining a torch inwards, looking at herself or himself and understanding how his own mind is being wired, right? So once you start to understand how you function and how you are wired, you acknowledge that. And with that acknowledgement, then you will be able to change your own perspective when you are relating to others, when you start to think of others, and when you're, when you're going through issues and difficulties with other people, you use that kind of perception that you have, the insights which you have gleaned from your mindfulness practice and apply that to the other party. And with that, then you understand and then you are able to let go of wanting to have an outcome which you desire. So with that, then you can afford to be contented and then you can be afford to, you can afford to be happy with the situation as it is. And like I mentioned earlier, externally nothing has changed. But internally your perception has changed. And that allows you to let go and to be just in the moment contented and be happy. 
Okay, thank you. So just uh, one more question. So from this anonymous attendee it says, hello, may I know what are the future directions for the HR Everyday Program? Are there plans to link up with existing local organizations providing mindfulness programs such as Brown Center? Thank you. I think the HL Every Everyday Program is, is not just mindfulness, you know, and I always tell uh, uh, my other friends who are doing mindfulness, it's not, not a depression, you do mindfulness, uh, anxiety also mindfulness, you know. So, so you see the program includes different kind of modalities, art, music, health education. So these are the, the, the techniques we're using now as a preventive measures and as evidence-based. And so we're doing a follow-up study of this group of people um, and beyond that, what we're going to do with the EW program is moving quite well, and we're extending to other other countries. Um, and the, the wonderful part of it, because of our the, the uh, Mind Science Center, a lot of link to other parts of the world. So friends in in, in England, America, are also very keen, e even to to follow some of the programs we're in, using here in Singapore. Okay, so one last question from um, from Babina Chat. So uh, they're saying, where can volunteers uh, to be find a list of course they could take to prepare them to support your programs? I I, I suppose May 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 is around. Our Mind Science Center website would be one place where they can sign up. Uh, there is the e-learning program as well, and then of course uh, they can participate in and train. There will be calls sort of uh, announcing when the training programs are run. So usually we run it twice, sometimes more. We not only train volunteers, but also the expert trainers come in again for training and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? So just to reiterate, um, the AWE program, actually there are a suite of uh, programs in there. Uh, mindfulness, of course, is uh, one of the main programs and everybody enjoys it because they really benefit from it. But there are also other things such as music reminiscence activity, there is art therapy, there's exercise, uh, meridian flapping in some uh, community centers. Uh, and of course, for everyone who participates in these programs, uh, there are the um, health education program as well. So in different CCs, they may choose to focus on different programs, right? Although almost all of them deliver the health education as well as the mindfulness, some CCs may choose to run a horticultural program or gardening. Uh, some may do meridian flapping, for example. Some may do music reminiscence activities. So there are slight differences in the different CCs. So it depends on whether there are trainers there who can deliver the programs and volunteers who, who are able to also deliver the program. Okay. So we do hope to uh, include other programs. We, we have talked about it. Um, choral singing is one that is, uh, again, available in certain centers. We have also talked about dance as a possibility. Right. Yes, yeah. dancing is in the um, interest of uh, Dr. C.K. Chong. He's been badgering me all the time. When they're doing the dancing research, you know, <laughs> now it's done, it's published now. Uh, I'm sure uh, you have great interest. Uh, it's in the book itself. Right? Right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we have just a couple of minutes left. Any comments from anyone? We want to thank um, Mr. Tao Heng Tan and the family for this generosity. I think uh, it's wonderful. Um, and lots of people are asking me earlier on, when's the next talk? Nick distinguished uh, lecturership on uh, Tao Tin Sing distinguished uh, lecture. And we uh, will tell you later on, and, and I know that we're calling all the interesting speakers something of relevance in your life. Okay, if there are no further questions, then I'd just like to thank the panelists actually for coming today, sharing with us their experience. Thank you so much. And I'm sure all of you would have been inspired by uh, hearing from what they had to say. Of course, Prof. Kwa. Uh, for his wonderful lecture and thank you all uh, for being with us this afternoon.
So once again, thank you so much to Prof. Rati and our dear panelists. And as we come to the end of this event, for those joining us online, we would really appreciate if you would be able to help us fill a post-event survey that is sent through the chat right now. And we will now be ending the live stream. Thank you so much for joining us online and wishing all of you a blessed Mother's Day.